This is the first time I'm doing such a talk. It's awesome. This is like the, the future, right? <laughs> or really, like through, yeah. through webinar. Yeah, never done yeah. that before. Yeah, I think it's a great format actually, uh, because having people fly, fly pe flying people in is like really expensive and it's really yeah. hard the dynamics. So even for like talks in in a congress or even you, you could do more webinar stuff. Yeah, uh, and like a PhD grading committees, etc. Yeah. Why not do it like this? That would be great. As long as the internet's stable, I think it works really yeah. well. Yeah. And also for people with. with uh, Maybe difficulties of like traveling, or maybe the family, or uh, everything. So yeah, just climate costs in general. Mm -hmm. So it's weird not to stand up while giving a talk. So I'm like, how does one give? <laughs> how does one talk without standing up and moving around? So <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I I love this uh, model or this scam because um, a rede de pesquisadores has already made uh, 18 webinars. 18? No, I don't know. 80, Pedro. 18. 80 webinars. Yeah. So, wow. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if Juliana was talking to you about the format. Uh, so Rede de Pesquisadores is like a researcher web mm -hmm. uh, network for like webinars. Mm -hmm. So they invite people. I don't actually know how you you select people for for the webinars, but they have monthly like two to five people invited, and it's really cool. Uh, I've watched like a couple before, and awesome. Uh, so uh, uh, I think we we can uh, go ahead and get started. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Anna Dreber. Uh, she's actually a, a professor in the Stockholm School of Economics in the Sweden, mm -hmm. and she's been involved with most, if not all, uh, prediction market projects uh, related to these big replication initiatives in the social sciences and psychology. Uh, and I mean, she's recently been very interested in questions like uh, how actually can researchers uh, judge the uh, replicability and robustness of uh, scientific work. And she's actually collaborating with us for, with the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative Prediction Market Project. So as you know, uh, we've been we've been inviting you to to do the pre-registration. Uh, I'll, I'll probably talk a little bit more in detail in, by the end of the webinar, like you know, with uh, details on the project again. Um, and I, I, I mean, I re, I'm sure that uh, Anna has a, a really interesting talk uh, waiting for us here. So with Let's that, I'll so. pass the word over <laughs> to you. Anna. Thanks. Thanks. So thanks. That was a very informative uh, introduction. So this is perfect. And I hope many of you will be interested in participating in our prediction markets. Uh, eventually. Okay, so this is very exciting for me. First time I'm doing such a webinar and I think it's a great idea. So thanks a lot for being here. Okay, so basically this is part of the general theme, sort of which scientific results can we trust. So I'm, I've been involved in various replication projects and uh, where we've added prediction markets in order to somewhat uh, assess the or try to estimate the reproducibility of science. So which results can we trust? Well, we know that this depends on a lot of things. There will always sort of be false results published in the scientific literature, not because of scientific uh, con artists faking data, but because of many other things. So in many types of sciences and social sciences, we talk about the p-values, statistical significance, we talk about statistical power, and we know that sort of given p-values and power, uh, we rarely will get 100% uh, of results which are true. Which results we can trust no. will also depend on things like, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, it's just to be sure. Uh, do you actually have slides to present? Or yes, you, uh, are you not seeing them? Oh, so you're not seeing uh, them. I think it's not uh, shared currently. Is there okay. like a button? Sorry. Then no, I will, no problem, uh, just, just to let you okay. know because. Now you see them. Or? Not, yeah, now it's working, yeah. Okay, oh, so now, now the whole interface looks different. That makes sense. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so which results can we trust? That depends on. P-values, statistical power, 
We talk a lot about publication bias, of course, on part of journals, but also on parts of researchers putting no results in five drawers. And then there are the various researcher degrees of freedom that in the social sciences have received a lot of attention, but very recently. So even though people have been saying similar things to say, Simmons et al, the false positive psychology paper since the 70s at least, this has not received a lot of attention and has not been something we've been taught in statistics courses, which is uh, problematic. But now we're thinking about p-hacking, the garden of forking paths, etc. So all of these phenomena will um, influence sort of which results we can trust. But then there are also these other things that have that are traditionally have been a bit harder to think about. So priors, for example. So what's the probability that a hypothesis is true? Um, sort of when interpreting whether a result is statistically significant, etc., we should also incorporate the prior. But uh, at least in most types of statistics that we do in the social sciences, we've shunned away uh, from thinking about priors. Why? Because they're typically subjective, so different researchers have different priors for different hypotheses, and they're often hard to access. So even if we would all kind of agree on some prior, I mean, maybe that would be the case, how would we even know? Because we're not assessing them um, in any way. So, so we know that all of these fa various factors play a role uh, to determine sort of the share of results that we can trust. Um, so what I've been interested in with lots of co-authors is basically to what extent do we know which results we'd replicate? If we find that we as the research communities are good at predicting results, maybe we could add uh, prediction market prices or our various measures of peer beliefs uh, as additional reproducibility indicators along with uh, many other uh, indicators. That's sort of some background. So more specifically, what we've been doing is uh, we've been adding prediction markets to uh, some of the big replication projects. So what are prediction markets, you might wonder. Um, so these are typically interfaces uh, or trading platforms where you often trade simple binary contracts. So let's say we're back in 2008 and we have the US presidential election. So here you could buy a contract in uh, Obama that is worth $1 if he becomes president and $0 if he does not become president. So with some caveats, we can interpret the price of this contract um, as the probability that the market assigns to this event. So if Obama sells for 91.5 cents uh, on a dollar, we can interpret this as Obama having a 91.5% probability of, of uh, winning the election. So if you think that the probability is higher than this, then you should buy this contract. Uh, if you think that the probability is lower, you can either short sell this contract or buy the opponent's contract, in this case, uh, John McCain. And depending on how people are trading these contracts, um, the price would be affected. So the, the key here is really that we have a very sort of clear definable outcome either obama becomes president or does not be, he does not become president uh, if he becomes president the contract is worth one dollar if he does not become president is worth zero dollars so we interpret the price as a probability that the market assigns to obama becoming president here so there are lots of studies using prediction markets in various fields and comparing prediction markets with say election polls in predicting uh, results and traditionally, prediction markets have performed better, in, uh, better than prediction polls, uh, sorry, better than election polls in predicting election outcomes. And then you might wonder why would that be the case? Well, if you have an election poll, you want a large representative sample. Say you have a, a few thousand people and you ask them, what party will you vote for or, uh, in, the, in the upcoming election? Or what uh, will you vote for, Obama or McCain? So what you get at the end of the day, even if you have a representative sample, is just the opinions of your representative sample of these 2000 individuals or whatever you have. So this can work, but we know that there are also sort of some problems sometimes with people saying what they will vote for, which might not necessarily be true. And it's hard to get really representative samples. So the idea here in a prediction market is that you don't necessarily need a representative sample because how I'm betting in a prediction market is not just a function of my political preferences, who I will vote for, 
But how I will bet in this prediction market is a function of who do I think will win. And that's, that's a function of uh, sort of uh, how, what I read in newspapers, what type of news I'm consuming, what I hear from friends and family, etc. So I could vote on, uh, on uh, John McCain here, but I actually want Obama to win. But I'm voting not according to my political preferences, but according to uh, sort of who, who I think will win the election. So you can, in, you can aggregate a lot more information in these types of prediction markets markets than you might be able to do in, uh, in election polls. So that's, that, that's the reason for why these markets uh, could perform potentially really well. Um, so why do I have this title, Could Gambling Save Science? So that's because of a fantastic uh, paper by Robin Hansen from 1995, where he basically proposes that we should be using prediction markets in science in order to, uh, in, we should have them in order to investigate what are true, uh, hypothesis of what are true phenomena. And you could have people, you as a funder, for example, can set up a prediction market in something and then have people trying to figure out whether, what the truth is, sort of what works, and, uh, and then they could uh, trade on this in a prediction market. Um, so prediction markets in science could be good for uh, many reasons. Say it could be, could be used for information dissemination too. So. Uh, if we have some prediction in a prediction market, um, it could be communicated to the public and it would be a, a, then a, a sign of traders' beliefs, which could be interesting. So prediction markets could also be good for information aggregation. So if you have uh, lots of various types of information dispersed among traders, the prediction market will combine uh, all of this information. And it differs typically from some simple averaging of beliefs. Um, prediction markets could also be used uh, to incentivize discovery, and this is really what Robin Hansen discusses. And then market makers, so we are market maker in our prediction markets, we can subsidize discoveries if we want. Um, so we typically use, and I will come back to this, Robin Hansen's logarithmic market maker, where if you want to trade in our markets, we are the counterparty, so you do not need to find uh, someone else to trade with. And we always offer buys and sells, and then we adjust the price uh, after each trade. But I mean, so far this is pretty vague. So what are we actually doing? So, so we, uh, I, as you see here, I have a picture of Magnus Johannes Somsi. He's one of my closest co-authors by far. So we worked a lot uh, on various projects, including the replication project, the big one in psychology, together with then 270 authors, which was led by Brian Olsek. So we also initiated an experimental economics replication project, and we were also part of initiating the nature and science, social science replication project. So for these uh, big replication projects, plus many labs too, which we were not involved in as replicators, we added prediction markets, um, and we also set up surveys in order to ask researchers whether they could predict uh, replication outcomes. But this is joint work with lots of other people, including my husband, Johan Almerberg, uh, Thomas Pfeiffer in New Zealand, uh, Yiding Chen at Harvard, and others. And Brian Osek, of course, who's played a key role here in the many other projects. Um, so what have we been doing? So you know already the outcomes of the, these big replication projects. In the psychology project, one third of results replicated. In the experimental economics project, uh, 11 out of 18 projects replicated. And for the social science replication project, uh, 13 out of 21 uh, papers replicated or results replicated. So we added prediction markets to these projects. Um, so we didn't have prediction markets for all 100 projects in the big psychology replication project, but we ran two sets of markets uh, for 44 of uh, these studies. And at the end of the day, we had results for 41 studies. Uh, we also ran one set of markets for the 18 experimental economic studies, um, one set of markets for the 21 social science replication uh, project studies, and then one set of markets for the for 28 many labs, two studies, but um, we only have outcomes for 24 of them because things changed between the time that we ran the market and uh, the time when the replications were done. So at each occasion here when we run a set of markets, um, we invite participants, we send out invitations to various uh, email lists and elsewhere, and basically 
ask researchers, hey, do you want to participate in our replication in our prediction market project? We will give you money between 50 and 100 US dollars. And uh, we will ask you to invest this money in, in the replications, in the hypothesis that are being tested. Um, so you can potentially lose all of this money or you can gain a lot more depending on how good you are at predicting um, replication outcomes. So we have the market open typically between 10 and 14 days. So we, we open up the market and then we let participants enter the market whenever they want and make these trades. Um, and typically we've had people just betting on whether a study will replicate yes or no. So a binary um, replicate using the binary replication criterion where it's very clearly defined that a study replicates if we find an effect in the same direction as the original study with a p-value less than 0.05 um, in a two-sided test. If, if this is the case, the contract is worth $1 and if this is not the case for any other outcome, the contract is worth $0. And then the question is, for what price are you willing to buy this contract? We did slightly more complicated things for the Many Labs 2 studies. So we also had participants, we allowed them to bet on effect sizes, but most participants did not really want to do this. I think a few years ago, people were less, in, less sort of used to thinking about this effect sizes uh, compared to now. So that might have been a reason for why people didn't really want to do this. So please tell me when I should have a break, when you think it uh, would be a good time to break. Otherwise, I'll just continue talking until someone uh, interrupts me. Okay. So in these prediction markets, um, so in the, big, in the replication projects, there was basically one central hypothesis that was replicated for each study. So that was, of course, what participants in these studies were betting on. And as I said before, we mainly had these binary outcomes. So participants knew what it meant that a study would replicate. And uh, participants traded contracts that were similar to what I said before. So they're worth $1 or 50 cents in some cases if the study replicates and otherwise is worth zero dollars. So we interpret the price here as the predicted probability of the outcome occurring with some caveats. I mean, there, there is some critique to this type of interpretation by Charles Mansky and others, but uh, we interpret this as the predicted probability of the outcome occurring. Um, and as I said before, we use this logarithmic scoring rule uh, where we allow participants to both go long in a contract so that they buy it and this would then move the price up but they can also go short in the contract so they they're short selling it so they're basically thinking that the price should be lower than what it currently is so we allow, allow for both types of trades and uh, when participants participate in our markets uh, we give them information about the planned statistical power uh, the planned sample the original paper and replication authors for the experimental economics project, as well as the social science project, we basically gave them replication reports where we spelled out all the differences between the original study and what we were planning to do in the replication uh, project. So all of, uh, we tried to sort of give participants as much information as possible. And in those projects, we also tried to have high statistical power and we did end up with very high statistical power in the social science project in particular. Uh, which is good to keep in mind when I show you the results later. So in these markets, we start prices of these contracts uh, at 50. So they could potentially go down to zero or up to 100, depending on how participants trade uh, in these uh, markets. And here are just some slides showing you what the interface looked like for various projects. So here was the interface for the psychology project. Uh, they could, if, when they logged into this uh, uh, trading interface, we then collaborated with Consensus Point, they would see the list of hypotheses um, that they could trade on. And then they would see the score, which is the price of the contract. As you see here, the price has increased from 50 to 54.76. Some, someone has recently traded in this and sort of gone long in this contract, so they bought this contract, basically indicating that they think that the probability that the study will replicate is higher than 50%, so therefore the price has gone up. So if I want to bet on this particular hypothesis, I click on adjust, and then I get some more information, including a link to the 
the replication. And I could click on yes or no, where yes means that I want to buy this contract. So I think the price should be higher than this 54.76. And no would be the opposite. And then I invest my some points here and uh, then I click submit and I made my uh, trade here. And then I would have a, my answers um, summary page with my uh, different positions. So which hypothesis am I betting on and in what position? Uh, did I, do I believe in it or not sort of given the price? Um, so for the experimental economics project, we, we uh, co-author uh, coded a new prediction market interface. So they had the list, there was a list of all the different hypotheses and you could see the current price, uh, the shares held for you and then the investment value. And you, if you would click on trade here, you could start trading in these hypotheses. So just so you remember, so just to recall what are these prices. So this, the Klippe et al, uh, with a price of 0.76. So we interpret this as the market believing that the study has a 76% chance of replicating. If you think the probability is higher, you should buy this contract. If you think the probability is lower, you should short sell this contract. Um, and then when you were, would uh, take a position here, so you would buy or sell this contract, um, you could see recent price movements too, to learn something about how other people had been uh, trading. So in all of these uh, projects, we also ran a pre-market survey. So we asked participants, how likely do you think it is that this hypothesis will be replicated on a scale from zero to 100%? And we also asked them basically, how well do you know this topic? Not at all, slightly, moderately, very well, and extremely well. Uh, and we then turned this into a one to five uh, variable. We did slightly more complicated things for the experimental economics project, but we didn't really gain anything from that. So we keep it extremely simple. So there are some important differences between the survey and the prediction market, as you can see. I mean, the survey is extremely simple. Um, there are no monetary incentives in the survey, and you also do not get any feedback in the survey. Whereas in the market, there are these monetary incentives. I mean, the contracts will be worth $1 um, if the outcome happens and $0 if it does not happen. So you have an incentive here to trade according to your beliefs and it's uh, incentive compatible. In the market, you can also infer something about other people's beliefs depending on uh, what trades have recently happened or what, trade, how, what prices are basically. So if I have some prior of an A hypothesis replicating and then I see that other people seem to have some similar prior because they traded similarly to what I was planning to do, then I've learned something and maybe that will affect how I'm trading here. So a, a fair comparison between this market and the survey could be that, well, we have monetary incentives in the market, pre-market survey, and we also give participants feedback about other people's beliefs from, say, the pre-market survey. So we're doing various uh, such projects too. So what are the results? I'll show you the results separately for the various projects and then I'll um, give you a simple combination of the results. Um, so here we have the psychology projects. So if you look at the figure, we have the market price on the y-axis. So it could potentially go from say zero to almost 100. And then we have the hypothesis ordered by market price on the x-axis. So we have successful replications in uh, uh, black and failed, uh, failed replications in red. So as you, and given the dispersion of um, prices here, we draw a line at 50 and basically say that if prices are higher than 50, uh, the market thinks that the study will replicate. And if prices are below 50, the market thinks that the study will fail to replicate. Um, and as you see, there are some black uh, studies below the 50 line, and there are also some red studies above the 50 line. Uh, but there are more red studies below than above, and more black studies above than below the 50 line here. Uh, so we do some simple tests, and I mean, I always talk about the importance of statistical power, and then at the end of the day here, I'm showing you 44 different studies, so uh, not that much, and with three being in gray because they're missing data. So the squares here are market prices, 
market predictions and uh, the circles here are survey answers. The filled circles are just a simple survey answer and the uh, unfilled ones are the expertise weighted surveys. So we find that the market uh, performs signific significantly better than chance, um, which is good news, uh, whereas the survey does not perform significantly better than, ch than chance in this uh, particular project. But uh, I mean, we're talking about not that many observations here. But this sort of was our first indication that there was some uh, wisdom of crowds, basically, for scientific results. So we also did set up a prediction market for the experimental economics project that I told you about. And here we found that the market and the survey were equally successful. Um, so interestingly here, uh, all prices and beliefs were actually above 50%. 11 out of 18 studies replicated, but all prices and beliefs were above 50. So the average prediction was a 75% replication rate and the survey average was 71. Um, and neither are different from 61, uh, and they're not different from each other. So, um, the, the, I think, in some ways, most interesting results we have is for the uh, prediction market that we ran for the social science replication project. So this is the replication project where we had the highest statistical power um, out of the replication projects that I was involved in, because here we did a two-stage um, replication process so that in the first stage of the replication we had 90% power to replicate 75% of the original effect size. If the study then failed to replicate we ran a second round of data collection uh, so that in the pooled sample of our data we would have 90% power to detect 50% of the original effect size. So this leads to sample sizes that are about four times as big as if we would have 90% power to detect 100% of the original effect size. So why do we do this? Well, even if sort of original results are true positive results, they might be exaggerated compared to the true effect. And if we then go for 90% power to detect only the original effect size, 100% of it, we could be underpowered. So this is a, a higher powered project than the uh, two previous ones I showed you. And here again, so we have our uh, we have our uh, 21 studies on the y-axis, and then we have prediction markets and survey beliefs on the x-axis. So successful replications are in blue, and uh, failed replications are in yellow. And we have diamonds here being uh, prediction market prices, and circles being prediction, uh, sorry, survey beliefs. And here we see that if we look at prediction market prices, all blue diamonds are to the right of all yellow diamonds. So the ranking here is perfect in the sense that the market predicted that all of the studies that did replicate, the market gave them all higher prices than the studies that failed to replicate. Um, and these are 21 studies. So again, we don't have much statistical power to compare the survey and the prediction markets, for example. But uh, if you would just look at this, the prediction, predictions from the surveys uh, do not perform really uh, uh, completely as well as prediction market prices here. So as I said before, we also added prediction markets to the Many Labs 2 project. So um, I guess most of you would know what project this is, another one of these fantastic big replication projects where several labs would replicate uh, each study. So replication power is large uh, or high also here. Uh, so we um, started working with the uh, Brian Osek and his team on this a few years ago. So we set up prediction markets for these, for 28 of these many labs to uh, studies, uh, perform prediction replications in the market in uh, 2014, sorry. And the many labs two results were recently published, then we could also publish the prediction market uh, results. So we ran two types of markets here. So we have the binary replicate yes, no. Um, and then we had people bet on the effect size. We gave them six distinct bins in which they could uh, put their money. Uh, and we had different uh, weights on these in the beginning. I hope this is clear. Is it is now a good time to take questions, you think? Or should I continue? Uh, 
Yeah, I believe like we can ask people. Uh, I forgot in the introduction to uh, to remember them. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, you can either uh, write them in the chat throughout the, the, the talk, uh, or you can raise your hand. There's a, a button down here and like ask the question through the camera and microphone as well. Uh, and well, feel free to, to do so throughout the whole talk. Uh, I actually have a, a, a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that, um, uh, the, I mean, the, the, depending on the, the project, the prediction markets had a, like a better uh, uh, performance than the survey of beliefs. And there, but there are some differences that uh, you talked about, like for example, the monetary compensation and also the aggregate information from you know people knowing what other people what other other people bet on. Uh, yes. Do you think what do you think it's the main factor here? I mean, uh, uh, it's you think it's more important to know what other people think about a certain experiment, or is like the engagement that they're like trying to bet on something and they might get rewarded? And the mindset of I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, so so good questions. I don't really know. <laughs> so now I'm speculating. So we have we've done some studies uh, of this. I mean, the prediction market is more engaging than the than the pre-market survey. In the beginning, we had sort of had the pre-market survey in order to get at something and then make people enter the prediction market. So I think we 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 set it up almost in a way that didn't really make the best out of the survey. Um, so I think the monetary incentives matter, but I also think that it's sort of, well, I'm guessing here. So I would think that it's fun to participate in the prediction market and trade and see sort of, yes, how are people performing? And I think the monetary incentives matter, but they're not that important. It's more a matter of like, it's fun to be able to like, yes, I performed well. I was good at predicting studies, uh, especially if yeah. you know other people who are trading. So oh. there are these, I mean, fantastic projects by Phil Tetlock with co-authors. Uh, where they come, they, I mean, so for the good judgment project and super forecasting, et cetera, where they compare prediction markets with um, um, surveys using the Delphi method where you give people feedback, et cetera. And the prediction market does not always perform better. So the survey can outperform. A survey can definitely outperform the uh, prediction markets. So in our mm -hmm. projects, they haven't really done it, uh, but I think we could design better surveys. But this is sort of, I think we're learning while doing. But the prediction markets, um, I would guess that they're, they're fun to participate in. I hope so. I think that's why people do participate. So we do get a lot of participants. If I go, no, now I can go back slides. Maybe I can, yes. So like uh, we had a few for our various prediction markets. I mean, between about 50 and 200, depending on the project from like just, emailing on the, like uh, the open science collaborations, open science frameworks, email list saying, hey, do you want to participate in a prediction market? Please email us and we'll give you an account, basically. So I think this is fun. I don't know if people would have answered the survey, though, if we wouldn't have had the prediction market. Okay. Yeah, that, so that's that sense, actually something that we're opening up, right? Uh, Sorry? Because that, that was actually my second question, is uh, for the, the, our, the Brazilian initiative, we were, we were considering opening up just the survey and not necessarily going into the prediction market afterwards. And the idea is uh, maybe it's a little bit less time consuming because you don't have to be, be no. And, but, uh, and one thing is uh, maybe some people are a little bit uh, intimidated by the idea of betting on a stock market because uh, I don't know, uh, I would guess that the average person doesn't have a lot of contact with like financial markets and how it works in the interface. <laughs> yeah. that, that's actually but a question. Uh, uh, do you provide any guidance, like a, a manual how to do this or for participants? Yes. Yeah, so we write, we have a, like, a, 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 we have a, some introductory page, in, like two pages describing how to bet in these markets. So, I mean, I am an economist, but I know very little about financial markets. So I don't, I've never bought a stock in my life. So I wouldn't know how to go into like a stock uh, market page sort of and buy things there. So you don't need a lot of information in order to participate in these markets, which is a good, so that's, that shouldn't scare away people <laughs> from trading. So we, we basically, we basically describe what I've said, but in a more pedagogical way than what I've uh, 
what I said a few minutes ago, describing sort of how you buy and sell this contract. What does it mean to buy and sell a contract in the sense that what should this indicate about your beliefs given the price, etc.? And uh, it should be extremely simple. I mean, look, look at these uh, trading interfaces again and these slides. So you have the hypothesis. You've already answered the survey where you say the probability that you assign the study replicating. And if I, th if I in the survey, answer that, yes, this is hypothesis 19, volatile, I think it had a 90% probability of replicating. All market prices here start out at 50. And I saw that, well, someone else seems to think that the price is, should be a little bit, should be above 50. I thought the, the probability should be 90. I'm going to click adjust here and invest, click then yes, and then invest half of my points or something here because I really believe in this hypothesis. So it's, it's fairly simple, I think. So we typically, I mean, most people who are participating here have not been economists. I mean, for the psychology project, for example, they were psychologists and they, I think, performed really well and didn't have that many questions because it was pretty straightforward. So I think that's, uh, yeah, if, if one is interested in this, one shouldn't be afraid of the interface. This will be uh, simple and hopefully self-explained. But we're, of course, available to answer, answer any questions anytime. So that was, uh, so uh, if anyone has uh, something else to add or ask right now, you can do so. If not, I think we can move on with the... Move on, Pedro. Yep. Okay. Move on. Okay. Great. So, so well, I can sum up what we have. So, so far we've done four prediction markets. Um, so we've had participants predict 104 different replication outcomes from these four replication projects. So if we say that, yes, a price above 50 indicates that the indicates that participants think that the, the study will replicate, then prediction, our prediction markets have a 73% correct prediction rate. So that's pretty good. I mean, it's better than randomness, which would be 50%, but we're not close to 100%. Um, so, but there is some wisdom of crowds, at least. And so when we look at the pooled survey data instead, so here we have 103 observations because for the psychology replication project, one replication changed from the time that we ran the survey to the time that we um, implemented the prediction market. So we have one missing observation. Here we find that the survey correctly predicts 66%, uh, so 68 out of 103 replication outcomes. So that's also pretty good. You know? So it's, it's 73 different from 66. I don't know. It's sort of, we need... Uh, to have more data here. So that's part of the reason why I sort of want to do a lot more prediction market projects and survey projects for lots of replication projects in order to get more data. So that when we have a thousand uh, studies here, what do we actually see? How much of a wisdom crowd is there? And uh, how can we design measures using prediction markets for surveys in order to really elicit uh, correct beliefs. That would be great um, to think more about. But the, this is very preliminary analysis that we report in one of our papers, and now we're working further on um, doing more elaborate analysis of this data. So something else we're uh, using prediction market prices for is to think about what's the what's the probability that the hypothesis is true at different stages of the testing process? I mean, so more in the past than now, there were these, I mean, uh, false interpretations of the p-value. So, it's, I mean, I've read many papers, that are, or maybe not the many papers, but I heard many people talk about the p-value as the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true. So this is obviously false, but um, many people tend to have that interpretation. And why? Because what we're really interested in, I guess, is sort of what is the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true? And this is not something that the p-value gives us, but something that we're clearly interested in. So this is what uh, Ioannidis and others, Button et al, etc., call the PPV, so the positive predictive value, the probability that the hypothesis is true. So with the prediction market price, um, 
we get the probability that the market uh, assigns to the study replicating. That's not the same thing as the probability that the study is true, uh, that the hypothesis is true, uh, but using uh, alpha and beta from uh, the replication, we can think about what is this uh, P1 here, uh, the probability that the hypothesis is true after the initial study, uh, but before the replication outcome. Then with some, uh, some statistics from the initial study, we can think about this P0, sort of the initial prior. What's the probability that the hypothesis is true before it's tested in the original study and thus also before we have the replication outcome? And then once we have the replication outcome, we can get this P2, so the posterior or the uh, yeah, prior to, whatever we call it. So the probability that the hypothesis is true after the initial study and after the replication outcome is known. And then we can start thinking about, okay, yeah, what is this probability that the hypothesis is true at different stages of uh, the testing process? So we do this exercise for uh, the psychology project, the, the subset of RPP studies. And I think one should take the numbers here with some grain of salt um, because we had lower statistical power in the replications than we hoped for in the whole big R. Uh, psychology project. But uh, I mean, I think this is indicative of something. So if you look at the, if you look at this figure, so we have probability on the y-axis and then we have this P0, P1 and P2. Uh, so the thick lines are the median probabilities. So then we can see, okay, what type of hypothesis are being tested in these uh, original studies? So the median probability here, the initial priors are low, um, not even 10, about um, the median is not even 10%. Then once these, uh, uh, the, the results of these hypotheses have been published in these top psychology journals with a p-value less than 0.05 result, the median probability is not that much higher than a coin flip. So the probability that the hypothesis is true, this p1, after the original study is, um, the median here is uh, 56%. Then once the outcome of a successful replication is known, this median probability jumps up and is very close to one. Whereas for fade replications, this median probability uh, becomes very low again. And I think th here is one reason maybe to take these uh, numbers with a grain of salt. I think this median probability goes too close to one in order for it to be completely uh, accurate, but it's indicative of something that we learn a lot from these replications in terms of shifting uh, this median probability that the hypothesis is true. So I th also think we learn something then more like a philosophy of science-ish about uh, the dynamics of hypothesis testing. Sort of. um, so what do we learn from this? Uh, well, as I said before, a common but false interpretation of uh, p-value less than 0.05 is that you have a 95% probability that the hypothesis is true. That's false, and for this to actually be the case, uh, p less than 0.05 finding needs to be so supported in a high-powered replications. And then we can ask these questions that I'm sure most of you have been thinking about. <laughs> I mean, that's why you're involved in these replication projects. Sort of, are the incentives for replications appropriate? Um, we also see that there is something systematic about results that replicate and results that do not replicate and the market can sort of pick up something about this not perfectly but there is some wisdom of crowds and something systematic about successful replications so successful results sort of uh, results that are likely to be true positives but the weird thing then i mean i'm thinking at least is that if there is some wisdom of crowds so if we are pretty good at figuring out which results will um, replication which will not why are we publishing all these false positive results in the first place if we're so good at picking out which these are but i mean just because we're good at it, this in the prediction market doesn't mean that the same people who are good in the market are necessarily being reviewers in all of these journals etc so there are many more questions to to be answered from these projects i think so we're involved in many other projects in particular we're working a lot with eric Ullman and co-authors so Eric uh, has a 
ton of fantastic uh, replication projects and, uh, with direct and conceptual replications where we're adding not necessarily prediction markets, but different types of survey questions. There are incentivized versus not incentivized with or without feedback, etc. So we're trying to set up basically forecasting surveys and have people predict uh, the outcomes of these replication projects. And then we have this fantastic uh, Brazilian reproducibility initiative that I think is completely awesome and fantastic what you guys are doing. So I'm very happy that we can add a prediction market to this and a survey. Uh, we're also working with DARPA in predict, on predicting um, uh, replication outcomes, uh, etc. So we have many uh, different uh, replication projects going on right now. One in neuroscience too that we just had the results from. Um, so what are some other thoughts? Prediction markets are not a solution to anything, but they're giving us some more information, I think, about studies. So in general, I'm of course a big fan of pre-analysis plans. I think they will help us a lot. Um, maybe we should obsess less with p-values too. Uh, I'm one of the maybe few uh, people who think that this p less than 0.005 um, threshold is a good idea. So I'm one of many authors on this Benjamin et al. redefine statistical significance paper. But we should also sort of go for higher statistical power, do team science to a larger extent. And I think this is very much in line with uh, what you are doing. Uh, so another project that we're currently working on, and hopefully we will invite participants to this market uh, soon, is a, a project where, which is not just a normal prediction market, but it's, it's a decision market. So, I mean, if we take a journal like PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, there are, they publish a lot of papers in the social sciences. So if we would do two years of social sciences papers, meaning psychology and behavioral economics, we would easily have 50 such papers. We cannot necessarily replicate all of these. So we can run like a prediction market on these 50 studies and then let the market decide which replications actually perform. So we can decide that well, all studies have a positive probability of being picked for replication. So it's incentive compatible to uh, bet on all of these papers. But we give extra weight to certain studies. For, for example, the ones that have the lowest prediction market price. Uh, so that are the least likely to replicate. Or we could think that studies that have market prices closest to 50 are the most interesting ones. Because there, the information value of a replication will be the highest. Then you could shift this. 50 to close to zero versus close to 100, uh, depending on the replication outcome, etc. So this is something that we're uh, thinking about. So this was a very quick and I hope not too messy, but slightly messy uh, summary of what we're doing on prediction markets. And it would be awesome if uh, people would want to participate in this for the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative, which I think is a fantastic uh, thing. So thanks a lot and uh, just email me or ask me now if you have any questions or uh, comments. So it's a little bit strange to give a talk like this when there is no immediate feedback, not basically even faces. So that maybe makes me talk too fast and I apologize for that. But okay, time for questions. Thanks, Anna. Uh, that was great. So again, uh, guys, if you have any questions, you can post them on the chat. Uh, so uh, I'm actually really interested in, in this last, the last section of your talk uh, you were mentioning uh, whether how to decide on what paper to, to try to reproduce or not in this kind of consortiums. Uh, and there's namely, a, I think of like psychologist science accelerator or any kind of committee to decide. Uh, and uh, what do you think the format for that would, do you think actually a prediction market would be the most informative way? Or maybe a survey on like people who are already no, already know a lot of just reproducibility. So in order to pick which studies should be replicated. Yeah. So I think, I mean, so I think the first, the people funding this or uh, people running it should decide. So what do they find the most interesting here? Uh, I mean, so if you have like hundreds of studies that you could potentially replicate, what do you actually want to learn? Do you want to learn sort of whether, um, the studies that people think are false positives actually are false positives? Uh, or do you want to see, do you think that it's the most interesting to see whether studies replicate where you have the highest disagreement between people? 
etc. So I think you as you as sort of the one setting up the project should should decide what you think is the most interesting to find out. And then you run this prediction market for all the say 100 or 200 studies. You need a lot of participants in order to go through so many studies. And then you say to tell your participants truthfully that all studies will have a positive probability of pick, being picked, so larger than zero, but you're going to put extra weight on certain studies. You don't have to say which ones these are because that shouldn't affect how people trade. They should just trade according to their beliefs. But then you, you choose, but you could say like 20 of these will be picked depending on my decision rule here. And all can be picked, so bet according to your beliefs. And then, uh, then you decide what you think is most interesting. So Yiling Chen that we're working on for the prediction market for your initiative, she is the world expert on decision markets, the world's theoretical expert on decision markets. So she is fantastic to have her involved in this. So she's also part of this PNAS decision market project. And I think this is really kind of exciting to, and a new kind of, yeah, a new fun extension of uh, the prediction market work. Uh, so you were mentioning uh, the like uh, what what papers to pick, and you 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 said like uh, maybe the ones with highest disagreement or the highest uncertainty, uh, and maybe the fifty percent or the lower. Mm -hmm. But but what about the ones with higher chance? I mean, I, I think that would be important too. I was uh, uh, I was reading a comment from Olavo Santos uh, from the Medilab, one of the Medilab labs uh, uh, coordinators. Uh, he was mentioning that like actually studying. Reproducing is really important for the success of the reproducibility uh, project as a whole. I mean, you, you want to have uh, a sample of papers that reproduce and don't reproduce, so you can kind of calibrate as well. Uh, so yeah. maybe um, including yeah. in your sample a couple of the ones that you think are really I mean, robust, you see if they actually do replicate, and of course, the ones that are on the lower boundary of confidence as well. Yeah, so I mean, if so with this type of decision market, we don't learn and we don't learn sort of what is the general uh, reproducibility because we don't get replication outcomes for all of these papers. So I guess it sort of what we actually learn depends on how much you think that prediction market prices are indicative of whether a study replicates. So, I mean, for these, let's say they have a 75% correct prediction rate. Well, it's not perfect, but it, at least something. So, I mean, I think this, this type of decision markets are the most interesting where sort of, yes, you, you just can't replicate everything and you think that some studies are more interesting to replicate than just picking a random sample. I mean, another idea would be to run a prediction market for like, let's say 100 studies and then to randomly pick 20 of them for replication. That's also incentive compatible. And then we learn something more, right? And then, because then, there should be studies with high prices and low prices, and we can say something about both types of studies. So it sort of depends on what's your goal function here. But all of that is interesting. I mean, when we're picking these 50 studies now in PNES, we, we don't want to get the, like a biased sample so that we only end up with studies for, that we, for some reason, do not think will replicate or something. We want to have a large... Uh, we just want it to be representative of what they publish, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, uh, Juliana, I actually had a question for you. Uh, by the end of this, I'll do like a little bit of just some announcements. Uh, no, answer. no no questions, Pedro. In the chat, okay. It's just uh, to uh, change the Anna screen to my screen for uh, sharing. Yeah. Uh, are you the moderator for that or can I actually I stop. I can stop sharing. Maybe. That yes, works. me too. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if you could put up my screen, I'm not sure. Yeah, share the screen. Yep. Above. Why? Ah, no, ainda não achei, não é Achou lá embaixo tem share, é uma faixinha verde. Aí tem uma setinha. Ah, tá, 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 tá. Yes. I said clock is screen. Yeah, I think it worked. Yeah. Uh, so, hey guys, uh, just a couple of announcements here. Uh, I'd like to thank thank Anna Dreber a lot for the you know the, for being available and doing this really nice talk to us. 
and uh, this has been recorded, so we'll be posting that on our YouTube channel, and it's also live on Facebook for people to check out afterwards as well. And uh, just so, I mean, for inviting people over, uh, the pre-inscriptions for our uh, prediction market for the Brazilian Reprodu Reproducibility Initiative are already open. Uh, after we get approval from the, the Harvard Ethics Committee, we'll uh, properly uh, do the, the term of consent and everything for participants, but, and uh, also Mayo give Mayo other institutions, but uh, you can already go to this form. And uh, many people from the same lab can actually participate. So the idea we let you have uh, as many uh, predictions as possible, individual predictions. And uh, so it's through this link, we've sent them through email uh, to you as well. You can uh, feel free to share with other people. And uh, also uh, just reminding, we're now in the last week of inscriptions for this No Budget Science Hack Week uh, with, uh, I think we've already sent a free email as well to you. The idea is uh, doing meta, meta science uh, projects during a, an intensive one week extended hackathon format. And uh, the it goes until the 9th of June. We are thinking about uh, prolonging a little bit the inscriptions, but uh, if, if you haven't checked it out, please do so. It will be a really nice event. It's unrelated to the initiative, but we're organizing here. Uh, and it, it, it looks really awesome so far. And yeah, the, the other webinars are already available in our YouTube channel, so you can go check them out. And I think that's it. Uh, I would really, if you have any questions, I can quickly chat, check the chat right now. But if not, uh, that, thank you, Anna, for being available. Thanks, here. thanks a lot. And I think we can kind of go back to Zoom here. Great. So uh, I think there's, there are no further questions here, at least not as of now. So uh, that was it. Thank you, Anna. Perfect. Was great. Thanks. Have a great day. Take care. Yeah, Bye. 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 Thanks, Anna. Sure.